The Bible describes creation as the formation of the universe out of nothing by the action of God. The creation account in the book of Genesis may use figurative language, but it is very different from the creation myths of Israel's pagan neighbors. In those myths, creation was the result of the triumph of some deity or hero over the pantheon or some god or primordial being such as Marduk's defeat of Tiamat or Baal's triumph over Yah. In all these myths, the universe arose out of pre-existing matter, the result of an undesired or unforeseen accident. The Genesis account, on the other hand, stresses the uniqueness and omnipotence of God. God creates out of nothing by the power of His Word. His creation proceeds according to an orderly plan and has a very definite purpose. All that He creates is good. At the beginning of creation, the earth was without form and void. The rest of the creation account is the story of how God formed the world and filled the void. A close look at the first chapter of Genesis shows a careful literary structure. We can look at the six days of creation as two sets of three days. In the first three days, God created forms. In the second three days, God filled those forms with inhabitants. Thus, there is a close correspondence between days 1 and 4, 2 and 5, 3 and 6. On the first day, God separated light from darkness, creating day and night, and thus time. On the second day, God created sea and sky, marking divisions of space. On the third day, God created dry land and filled it with vegetation, the beginning of life. On the fourth day, God created the stars, the sun and the moon to rule the day and night and to mark the seasons and days and years. On the fifth day, God created sea creatures and birds to fill the sea and sky. On the sixth day, God created animals and humans to fill the dry land. At the end of creation, God rested and made a seventh day holy. This holy seventh day suggests a covenant with creation. It crowns the work of creation the way a pediment crowns a temple. In contrast to the almost random creation recorded as part of Near Eastern mythology, the account in Genesis carefully uses the creation to convey important truths about God's relationship with the universe. And God saw that it was good. We read this statement four times in the first chapter of Genesis. At the end of creation, behold, it was very good. The message is clear and simple. Creation is good. 
It is not the work of some evil or incompetent demiurge. The material world was created to be good. And though it was subsequently wounded and disordered by the sins of Adam, creation is being restored and renewed in Jesus Christ. Unlike any other creature, man and woman were made in the image of God. We are not of course equal to God, but we have the potential to relate to God and live as part of God's family. Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, God says. The next time the words image and likeness appear together, they refer to Adam's begetting his son Seth in his own likeness after his image. The language points out that we are related to God the way Seth was related to Adam. Genesis describes the pristine creation in sacred terms. According to Jewish tradition, the Garden of Eden is the Holy of Holies, the most sacred core of the cosmic temple that is the world. The seven days of the creation story parallel the narrative of the building of the tabernacle, which proceeded according to the seven commands and the erection of the temple, built in seven years. The world is thus viewed as a cosmic sanctuary filled with God's glory, and Adam is portrayed as the first priest. The church does not require Christians to believe either that the universe came to be in six literal days, or that it did not. Christians are free to interpret the scientific evidence for themselves. Even the church fathers were divided. Many insisted on the literal interpretation. Six days mean six days as we count them today. But even in early centuries, others took a different view. Saint Clement of Alexandria warned against a literalistic interpretation. How could creation take place in time, seeing time was born along with things which exist? Our days are 24 hours long, Saint Augustine wrote, but we must bear in mind that these days indeed recall the days of creation but without in any way being really similar to them. The truth of Genesis, however, is not at all in doubt. Genesis may use poetic and figurative language, but the important message that language expresses is clear. The universe is God's creation, and that creation is good. It was creation ex nihil, out of nothing. Moreover, the creation of man, however it may literally have taken place in time, is a special act by God. Man was created good and given stewardship over creation. He brought evil and disorder into the world by his own disobedience these truths are basic axioms, so to speak, for the rest of Scripture, and they are fundamental to the Christian faith. The Church has given some guidelines for understanding the scientific data about cosmic and human origins in light of the biblical doctrine. It has ruled out atheistic evolution the belief in blind progress unguided by God. And the Church has condemned polygenism, the belief that mankind descended from multiple ancestors.
The Genesis creation narrative establishes a theological worldview. Its purpose is not scientific but apologetic, countering the many myths of the ancient Near East. The pagan stories speak of multiple gods which are somehow embodied in nature. These gods have limitations and needs. The world emerged as a result of a struggle between them and mankind was created to serve the gods in slavery. Genesis counters this worldview, teaching clearly that there is only one God that he is not limited by space, times, or nature, that he created the entire cosmos by his mere utterance, and that he made the human race in his own image. The relationship between God and creation is the basis for all the rest of biblical revelation. The Old Testament prophets looked forward to a renewal of creation, a time when the land would produce abundantly and people would live in peace, faithful to God's covenant. The Old Testament wisdom literature presents a more developed reflection on created order. In the fullness of time, the New Testament presents Christ as a new Adam, the focal point of a long-awaited new creation. The Gospel of John begins with a restatement of the creation account. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So far, there is nothing startling in John's interpretation. But seven lines later, John tells us something astounding. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word of God, present at creation, became the man Jesus Christ. The power of God the Father created the universe through the love of God the Son. Creation begins with water and spirit, and the Spirit of God was moving over the face of waters. Christ told us, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. The striking parallel suggests that baptism initiates a new creation, and Paul's make a suggestion and explicit statement. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. Paul tells us that creation has been in bondage until the coming of Christ. Thus the coming of Christ makes all things new, a promise that will be fulfilled perfectly at the end of time, when a new heaven and a new earth will replace the old. But Christians already possess the new creation in baptism. Do they live in this world? They are already citizens of the heavenly Jerusalem. 